and welcome to the Firm Foundation series. My name is Dale Yancey. Today it's lesson 34, Elijah and Elijah's Most Excellent Adventures. I've got the movie popcorn popping here right in front of my face because I'm going to talk to you a little bit about superheroes because we live in an age of superheroes. By that I mean we're fans of superheroes. I mean we have movies like Captain America, Civil War, or The Avengers, and they've become smash hits both here as well as around the world. Everybody wants to go see these movies. Also, films like Superman and Batman series are so popular. And then there's Spider-Man, Iron Man, and even Ant-Man. And then on television, we have Supergirl and The Flash. I mean, you can't escape the influence of superheroes today. And I think we love superheroes because they've got superpowers that we'd all like to have. I mean, the powers like the Wolverine to heal himself or to regenerate limbs. I mean, this guy's never going to be counted out of a fight because he can always heal himself and get right back into it. And then there's the web spinning abilities of Spider-Man which allow him to swing through a downtown metropolitan area just like Tarzan. And what could be more awesome than Superman's ability to fly or, or go faster than a speeding bullet? That's not a bad skill set especially when you're stuck in rush hour traffic. And then there's the superhuman strength of the Incredible Hulk or the ability to, to be invisible like the Invisible Woman. Or the super speed of the flash. I mean, when you're bored, in just a few seconds, you could be relaxing on a beach in Maui or Fiji without ever having to buy a plane ticket. And the list of superpowers, it goes on and on. Maybe it's because we feel so powerless and unable to change things in our society today or, or even the ability to make a difference. And so often we sense that so many things are out of control. There's rampant lawlessness and we have corruption at all levels of government. So often we'd like to have someone just like Captain America show up and root out all the evil and bring about some much needed justice. Well, along those lines, God has his own superheroes. And in the Old Testament, they are known as the prophets. The most wicked king in the Old Testament was Ahab, along with his wife Jezebel. He did more to provoke God to anger than all the other kings of Israel. The Bible says that wickedness filled the land. Yet God declared that there were 7,000 people there in Israel who had not bowed down or worshipped Baal during that very wicked time. So see, even in the midst of wickedness and evil, God knows those who are His. God knows those who are walking uprightly and righteously. Well, earlier God had sent warnings and He waited patiently for His people to separate themselves from the pagan influences that surrounded them and to return to true worship. But now God was going to bring about severe judgment on the nation to stir them to action. Well, God explains to us in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Well, to announce the punishment and warn the nation to change its ways, God sent a messenger, Elijah the prophet. Well, now, as I mentioned in our last lesson, some of the material for today's lesson comes from The Bible for Dummies by Jeffrey Gagan, Professor of Biblical Theology at Boston College, and Dr. Michael Homan, Professor of Biblical Studies at Xavier University of Louisiana, and is published by Wiley Publishing Incorporated. Their book, The Bible for Dummies, is an excellent resource to give you a better understanding of the Bible. I mean, they explain everything in plain English, along with some great illustrations, and of course, they throw in their dose of humor and wit. So if you want to get a better overall understanding of the Bible as you're going through this Firm Foundation series, then I urge you to go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or anywhere else and order this outstanding resource, The Bible for Dummies. Well, now let's review last week's lesson, The Division of Israel, before we get started with today's uh, lesson on Elijah and Elisha, okay? Question number one. Was the division of Israel into two nations prophesied in advance? Yes. The prophet Ahijah prophesied to Jeroboam, telling him that God would tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon. And two, after reaffirming his position as the new king, Rehoboam met with his advisors. Which advisors did he listen to, his elders or other young men like himself? He listened to his friends who were young men just like himself. And three, the elders had counseled Rehoboam to lower the tax burden on the northern tribes. And what did Rehoboam do? He increased the tax burden substantially. And this was the tipping point that caused the ten tribes to break away and become their own northern kingdom. And four, what two tribes comprised the southern kingdom? Judah and Benjamin. Five, what sin did Israel's first king Jeroboam commit? Idolatry. And six, how did he commit idolatry? 
Well, he set up a golden calf, and then he proclaimed, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And seven, what husband and wife team are among the most evil and vilified characters in the entire Bible? King Ahab and Jezebel. Eight, Jezebel, along with her husband, King Ahab, endorsed the worship of which false god? The god of Baal. Nine, in the novel The Source, which act was done to ensure a good harvest and save the town from its enemies? It was a sacrifice of firstborn sons to the god of Baal. Ten, Timna, grieving for her son who was sacrificed to Baal, has this thought. What was she thinking as she watched her husband walk off to spend the night with a temple prostitute? Here's what she was thinking. She was thinking, with different gods, her husband would have been a different man. And finally, 11. We become like the blank, we, blank. Fill in the two missing words. We become like the gods we worship. Okay? And now we come to A. King Ahab kills his next door neighbor. The theme here is that God is holy and righteous. He demands death as a payment for sin. Well, King Ahab, the tenth king of Israel, and his wife Jezebel, are among the most vilified and evil characters in all the Bible. They both commit horrible crimes against their people for personal gain. They also endorse the worship of the Canaanite god Baal and Baal's divine girlfriend Asherah. Ahab, like most of the kings of Israel before and after, worships a variety of deities. However, even worse than his apostasy is a crime that he commits against a neighbor. Next door to Ahab's palace lives a man named Naboth, who owns a vineyard. Ahab wants Naboth's vineyard because it's choice land. However, Naboth refuses to sell it. Let's read about the incident here in 1 Kings chapter 21, starting at verse 1. Well, this is what happened next. Naboth from Jezreel had a vineyard in Jezreel next to the palace of King Ahab of Samaria. Ahab told Naboth, Give me your vineyard. It will become my vegetable garden because it is near my house. I'll give you a better vineyard for it. Or if you prefer, I'll pay you a fair price for it. But Naboth told Ahab, The Lord has forbidden me to give you what I inherited from my ancestors. So resentful and upset, Ahab went home because of what Naboth from Jezreel had told him. Naboth had said, I will not give you what I inherited from my ancestors. So Ahab lay on the couch. He turned his face from everyone, and he refused to eat. In other words, he was pouting like a little kid. His wife Jezreel came to him and asked, Why are you so resentful of everything? Why don't you eat? He told her, I talked to Naboth from Jezreel. I said to him, Sell me your vineyard, or, if you like, I'll give you another vineyard for it. But he said, I won't give you my vineyard. His wife Jezebel said to him, Aren't you the king of Israel? Get up, eat, and cheer up. I'll give you the vineyard belonging to Naboth from Jezreel. So Jezebel wrote letters, signed them with Ahab's name, and sealed them with his seal. She sent them to the respected leaders and nobles living, living in Naboth's city. In these letters she wrote, Announce a fast. Seat Naboth as leader of the people. Have two good-for-nothing men sit opposite him and accuse him of cursing God and the king. Then stone him to death outside the city. The men in Naboth's city, the respected leaders and nobles who lived there, they did what Jezebel asked them to do. They did just as she had written in the letters that she sent. They announced a fast and had Naboth seated as the leader of the people. The two good-for-nothing men came in, sat opposite him. In front of the people, these men accused Naboth of cursing God and the king. So the people stoned him to death outside the city. Then the leaders sent this message to Jezebel. Naboth has been stoned to death. Verse 15, Jezebel received the message and said to Ahab, Get up! Confiscate the vineyard which Naboth from Jezreel refused to sell you, because he's dead now. When he heard about Naboth's death, Ahab went to confiscate the vineyard. 17. Then the Lord spoke his word to Elijah from Tishba. Go, meet King Ahab of Israel, who lives in Samaria. He went to confiscate Naboth's vineyard. Tell him, this is what the Lord asks. Have you murdered someone just to confiscate a vineyard? Then tell him, this is what the Lord says. At the place where the dogs licked up Naboth's blood, the dogs will lick up your blood. In verse 20, Ahab asks Elijah, so you found me, my enemy. Elijah answered, I found you because you sold yourself to do what the Lord considers evil. So I'm going to bring evil on you. 
I will destroy your descendants. I will destroy every male in Ahab's house, whether slave or free man in Israel. I will make your family like the family of Jeroboam, Naboth's son, and the house of Baasha, son of Ahijah, because you've made me furious. You led Israel to sin. 23. Then the Lord spoke through Elijah about Jezebel. The dogs will eat Jezebel inside the walls of Jezreel. And verse 24, If anyone from Ahab's house dies in the city, dogs will eat him. If anyone dies in the country, birds will eat him. There was no one else like Ahab. At the urging of his wife, he sold himself to do what the Lord considered evil. He did many disgusting things as a result of worshipping idols as the Amorites had done. The Lord confiscated their land for Israel. When Ahab heard these things, he tore his clothes in distress, and he dressed in sackcloth. He fasted, he lay in sackcloth, and walked around depressed. And then the Lord spoke his word to Elijah from Tishba. Do you see how Ahab is humbling himself in my presence? Because he's humbling himself in my presence, I will not let any evil happen to his family while he's alive. I will bring evil on it during his son's lifetime. So Ahab is so upset after being rebuffed that he returns home and he refuses to eat. Basically, he's pouting like a little kid. And Jezebel tells Ahab to relax, saying that she'll take care of everything. So Jezebel pays two of her subjects to lie, saying that they overheard Naboth cursing the king and God. Because these are capital offenses, Naboth is summarily executed, and his property goes to Ahab. Now Ahab and Jezebel would have gotten away with this crime were it not for God and his prophet Elijah. God tells Elijah to confront Ahab. God tells Elijah to confront Ahab, who is out looking over his newly acquired property. When Elijah finds Ahab in Naboth's vineyard, he tells him that both he and Jezebel will die for what they've done. Elijah pulls no punches. He says, In the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, so dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, your blood. This eventually does come to pass. But before their undoing, Ahab and Jezebel make a lot more trouble for Israel. Yet, as is the case of Naboth's vineyard, at each step of the way, they have to reckon with God's prophet Elijah and his dutiful understudy, Elisha. And now we come to B, Elijah and the widow. Well, Elijah and Elisha are extraordinary prophets, and their journeys and battles epitomize a complete devotion to God. Elijah is initially called by God to travel across the Jordan River into the desert where he's fed by ravens. Soon thereafter, Elijah travels to Phoenicia, where he meets a widow, and he brings her son back to life. Let's read 1 Kings chapter 17, starting at verse 8. Then the Lord spoke his word to Elijah, Get up, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. I have commanded a widow there to feed you. He got up, and he went to Zarephath. As he came to the town's entrance, a widow was gathering wood. He called to her, Please, bring me a drink of water. As she was going to get it, he called her again. Please bring me a piece of bread too. She said, I solemnly swear, as the Lord your God lives, I didn't bake any bread. I have only one handful of flour in a jar and just a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering wood. I'm going to prepare something for myself and my son so that we can eat it and then die. Then Elijah told her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you said, but first make a small loaf and bring it to me, and then prepare something for yourself and your son. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. Until the Lord sends rain on the land, the jar of flour will never be empty and the jug will always contain oil. She did what Elijah had told her. So she, Elijah, and her family had food for a long time. The jar of flour never became empty and the jug always contained olive oil, as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Afterwards, the son of the woman who owned the house got sick. He got so sick that he finally had no life left in him. The woman asked Elijah, What do you and I have in common, man of God? Did you come here to remind me of my sin and kill my son? He said to her, Give me your son. Elijah took him from her arms. He carried him to the upstairs room where he was staying, and he laid him on his own bed. Then he called to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought misery on the widow I am staying with by killing her son? And then Elijah stretched himself over the boy three times, and he called to the Lord, Lord my God, please make this child's life return to him. Then the Lord heard Elijah's request, and the child's life returned to him, and he was alive again. 
Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upstairs room of the house. He gave him to his mother, and he said, Look, your son is alive. The woman said to Elijah, Now I am convinced that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. Well, we're told that the Lord was withholding rain from Israel, in verse 1, and the drought was in judgment of the nation's rampant idolatry, led by the royal couple Ahab and Jezebel. In verse 8, the Lord commanded Elijah to go to Zarephath, a town that was outside of Israel, where a widow would provide food for him. He obeyed, finding a woman who was gathering sticks. And he said to her, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink, and bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Well, the widow, however, was in great need herself. She responded, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and just a little oil in a jug, and now I'm gathering a couple sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, and then we're going to eat it and die. She expected the meal that she was about to fix to be the last for her and her son. She had no other prospect than to die of starvation. Well, Elijah's answer was surely a test of her faith. See, he told her that she was to make some food for him. And using the last of her ingredients, she was to bake a little cake for him. And he added the promise, For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, the jug of oil shall not become empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. The widow's faith was evident in her obedience, and God was faithful to his promise. She and he and her household, they ate for many days. The jar of flour never grew empty. It was never exhausted. Neither did the jug of oil ever become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. The widow's food supply was supernaturally extended, as Elijah had promised. And here is the uh, spiritual truth that God wants us to gain from this. The giving of our first fruits to the Lord, the giving of our tithe, giving right off the top the, the first tenth of whatever it is that we have, whether it's your, uh, your paycheck, whatever it is that you make or create, you give the first tenth to the Lord, and then God blesses and multiplies. And that's what God did here with the widow. She basically gave uh, the last of what she had, she gave it to Elijah, the prophet of God. She gave it to him, which was like giving it to the Lord. And in giving it to him, God blessed her and he multiplied her resources. He, he multiplied the flour and the oil so that it never became exhausted throughout the entire famine. And so that's God's principle, giving first to the Lord. Not giving God leftovers, but giving God the first fruits of our income, of whatever it is that we have or make. Give the first of it to the Lord. Give the first and the best, and then watch God multiply and provide for us in every way. Well, Elijah stayed there with the widow and her son for some time, living in an upper room there in the widow's house. But later the woman's son died of an illness, and in her anger and grief, she blamed Elijah for his death. She assumed that God was judging her for her sin. But Elijah cried out to God, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. And the life of the child was restored. The boy came back to life. And when the woman saw this, she said, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Well, this account of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath, it offers many insights. Number one, God often uses unlikely people and sources to accomplish his purposes. 2. God's mercy extends to all people, both Jews and Gentiles, and the Sidonian widow was blessed for her faith. And 3. God requires faith. The widow's miracle only came after she prepared a meal for Elijah, which was an act of sincere faith on her part. And 4. There is a blessing when we give to God whatever we have, even if it's the last bit of food in the house. This was the effect of an offering that she was being asked to give willingly to God by making a meal for Elijah with the last bit of flour and oil that she had. And God saw her faith. He multiplied her flour and oil so that it lasted throughout the drought. In the New Testament, Jesus sits down across from the temple treasury. He watches people throwing in their offerings to God. And many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came. She put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. And calling his disciples to himself, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, she gave out of her poverty. 
She put in everything. She put in all that she had to live on. Well, this is exactly what we see going on here between the widow and Elijah. She's being asked to give all that she has to live on to the man of God, Elijah. And now we come to C, showdown at Mount Carmel. The theme here is God's supreme and sovereign, and God is all-powerful. Distraught over Israel's apostasy under Ahab and Jezebel, Elijah gathers all of Israel to Mount Carmel, where he's scheduled a competition. Elijah sets up a contest with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah on Mount Carmel. Elijah invited these false prophets and all Israel to the demonstration to show that Baal had no power at all against the Almighty God of Israel. And the outcome would demonstrate who served the true God. Now this fire from the sky stuff should be easy for Baal because after all, as the God of the storm, lightning is a specialty. But despite this advantage, the prophets of Baal try all morning with prayer, ritual dance, even bodily mutilation to get their God to respond, but nothing works. So let's read about it here in 1 Kings chapter 18, starting at verse 26. They took the bull he gave them, prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. They said, Baal, answer us. But there was no sound, no answer. So they danced around the altar that they had made. At noon, Elijah started to make fun of them. He said, Shout louder! Since he's a god, maybe he's thinking or relieving himself. He's going to the bathroom. Or maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's asleep and can't hear you and you have to wake him up. So they shouted louder. They also cut themselves with swords and spears until their blood flowed. And this is what their ritual called for. Well, in the afternoon, they continued to rant and rave until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was still no sound, no answer. No attention given to them from their God. So Elijah starts to make fun of the gods of Baal, saying that maybe they're asleep or going to the bathroom or traveling or can't answer. Maybe they're asleep and they need to be awakened. So the prophets of Baal shout louder, but they don't receive any response from their gods, so they finally give up. And now, now it's finally Elijah's turn to take center stage. Let's read what happens here. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 34. Now this is Elijah. Elijah said, Fill four jars with water. Pour the water on the offering and on the wood. And then he said, Do it again. And they did it again. And then he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar. And even the trench was filled with water. When it was time to offer the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward. And he said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, make known today that you are the God in Israel and that I'm your servant, and have done all these things by your instructions. Answer me, Lord, answer me. Then these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are winning back their hearts. And all of a sudden a fire from heaven fell down and consumed the burnt offering, wood and stones and dirt. The fire that, that came down even dried up the water that was in the trench. And all the people saw it, and they immediately bowed down to the ground. The Lord is God, they said. The Lord is God. Elijah told them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let any of them escape. The people seized them. And Elijah took them to the Kishon River and he slaughtered them there. The theme here is God is holy and righteous. He demands death as a payment for sin. So see, Elijah has them pour water on the sacrifice. The same sacrifice that they were trying to get their gods to respond to all day long. Finally now it's about evening time. So Elijah says... Pour water on the sacrifice three times to show that God can start a fire even when the wood is soaking wet. And then Elijah begins to pray. And suddenly fire descends from heaven and it consumes the sacrifice. It's a fantastic victory for God and Elijah. All the people acknowledge that the Lord, He is God. And at Elijah's command, all the prophets of Baal are seized and they're killed. Elijah then runs faster than Ahab's chariot back to the city of Jezreel where he tells everyone the news Jezebel, who's fed up with Elijah's God talk and angry over the loss of her prophets, she vows to kill Elijah. Remarkably, the man, Elijah, who has just stood up to the prophets of Baal, he begins to run for his life. He's scared of Jezebel. And now we come to D. The Lord speaks to Elijah. The theme here is God communicates with man. So Elijah travels south to Mount Horeb, which is another name for Mount Sinai, where God gave Moses Israel's law. Along the way, Elijah is miraculously sustained for 40 days without food. At Mount Horeb, Elijah experiences an earthquake, 
a great wind and a fire, which is also reminiscent of what the Israelites experienced here when God met with when Moses met with God. However, God said that he's not in any of these phenomena. And the reason is because these phenomena are too closely associated with the storm god Baal. God therefore reveals himself to Elijah in the sound of a thin, small whisper. Then God asks Elijah, What are you doing here? And without waiting for an answer, God tells Elijah to perform three tasks. Anoint an Israelite military commander named Jehu as Israel's king. Anoint the next kin of Israel's neighbor, Aram, and appoint Elijah as his successor. Now we come to E, passing the torch to Elisha. Well, Elijah eventually finds Elisha, and they're traveling together for a short time. Wanting some privacy from an entourage of prophets who seem to be following them everywhere, Elijah takes off his cloak. He touches the Jordan River, which miraculously parts so that they can cross over. Again, this is a miracle similar to Moses' parting of the Red Sea. On the other side of the Jordan, Elijah says farewell to his friend, and a fiery chariot descends from heaven and takes Elijah away in a whirlwind. And now that he's traveling solo, Elisha crosses back over the Jordan River into Israel, and he picks up where Elijah left off. And we'll look at that in next week's lesson, in our next lesson, number 35, which is Elijah and Elisha's Excellent Adventures Continued, Part 2. Okay? Well, I want you to remember this, that there were 7,000 persons in Israel who had not worshipped Baal during this very wicked time. And that's true today. You see, no matter how evil this nation or world is becoming, no matter what temptations you may be facing, no matter how many of those around you are giving in and just going with the flow, God says that there were 7,000 people in Israel during the time of Baal worship, during the time of Ahab and Jezebel, who had not bowed down to the false gods of Baal. And the question that's posed to both you as well as myself is, will you be one of those who's standing fast and not giving in? I mean, we can't do it in our own strength. I mean, we can only stand fast as we put our faith and our trust in Almighty God, El Shaddai, the Almighty God of Israel, the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth. Remember the theme, man must have faith in order to please God and be saved. So in our next lesson, 35, we'll look at the excellent adventures of Elijah and Elisha continued, part two. Well, that's it for this lesson. And I hope you'll plan on joining me uh, for our next lesson, 35, as we continue and look at the, the life and times of Elisha, the prophet. And it's going to be just as exciting as Elijah as we read about all the miracles he did. And truly, both Elijah and Elisha are superheroes. They're God's superheroes. Until then, I hope you have a, a great week, a blessed week. I hope that the shalom, peace of God would be, be upon you and your family. Until then, this is Pastor Dale saying bye.